I'm Andrew Warner. I'm the producer for the Long Now Talks at the Interval and your host for this evening. Psychedelics and other mind-altering substances are among our oldest continually used technologies with evidence of use stretching back at least 5,000 years. Today they remain hotly contested and are wildly popular despite a 50-year war on drugs. That's done nothing to mitigate that. Here to help us look at that past, explain the present, and reveal possible futures is Ismail Ali. Welcome, Ismail. Good evening, everyone. How y'all doing? Yeah? All right, love this energy. I want to appreciate the Long Now Foundation. This is my first time here at the Interval. And it was really cool because I had heard about the Long Now Foundation before, but once this was announced, I had like dozens of people come up and be like, oh my God, it's so cool that you're doing this talk. And I'm also really excited because I love doing talks in person. My name is Ismail Lodi Ali, and I'm currently the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, also known as MAPS. I was born in Fresno, California. I was raised by two parents who were uh, immigrants. My mother was born in Cali, Colombia. My dad was born in Delhi, India, but raised in Karachi. They left uh, their respective countries to escape political and economic turmoil. And then a few years later, some years later, 9-11 happened and that really changed everything for me. As a young Muslim raised in the Central Valley of California, some of you may have spent some time there. People also call it the Bible Belt of the West Coast. It was really interesting to immediately be kind of thrust, I like to say, politically socialized without my consent. As a person who was a Muslim kid, multi-racial, multicultural, and just like realizing that there was this larger arc of history that was happening around me. And I was kind of forced into that uh, understanding at a really young age. And it kind of made me really depressed. It made it really difficult. I was full of angst, uh, full of uh, kind of resistance uh, to the status quo as it kind of was imposed on me. Until I wasn't. I uh, discovered psychedelics. <laughs> as a teenager and was immediately welcomed into rave culture. And I like to say that that angst turned into curiosity. And that was really a huge shift. That was over 15 years ago. And that shift from angst to curiosity is a big part of what I think keeps me kind of going, even in the midst of a constant barrage of really depressing and continually existentially confronting news that I feel like we're all getting all the time. That was my late teens. I. Uh, when I was uh, 20 years old, I uh, ran into my family member in Colombia visiting. I hadn't seen them for a long time, and I was like, didn't know anything about LSD, you know, you know, acid at their parties, because I was throwing raves, you know, as a young person and kind of undergrounds. And um, that was when I learned that I had family members that had been working in the realm of bridging transpersonal psychotherapy and psychedelic shamanism for literally decades. So I'm here telling my family member, have you heard of LSD? And they're like, you have no idea. So I was taken, they took me to the desert. You know, when I was in my early 20s, I spent some time in um, Wirikuta and San Luis de Potosí. It was kind of my first contact with a more spiritual practice. I had been seeking that, but didn't really know what it was I was seeking until I started to make contact with some of these older traditions. So a few years later, I went to law school, ended up working for the ACLU of Northern California, and eventually for MAPS. And over the last few years, I've kind of moved into a place where I get to, I feel very grateful for, I get to be in conversation as an educator about psychedelics to the public, uh, to professionals like lawyers and doctors, but also to legislators. I spend a lot of time now speaking with um, people who are elected, uh, both in the United States and as well as around the world, around like what psychedelics are, how they work, and in many cases, as I can go into more later, um, how to talk about them without sounding crazy. Um, and there are a lot of people who are interested and who are kind of interested in the closet, but what's happening is that the barrier to entry to talking about psychedelics is starting to reduce. And I think a lot of you may be familiar, but MAPS is a nonprofit that was founded at 01986. Um, I don't know how, what, the, what the naming convention is when you add the zero, but I thought that'd be cute. And uh, we've been sponsoring psychedelic assisted therapy trials for the last 20, 25 years. Um, and we educate people to benefit from the careful uses of psychedelic, psychedelics and marijuana. So we're really an educational research organization that is really looking toward kind of I think for a long time the frame, and this is true of a lot of drug policy, the frame was how do we dismantle the current system? And what I've realized in a lot of what MAPS works on um, and what I work on with my colleagues that are here in other places is the kind of the building of the alternative infrastructure. Like what is it that we go to? Um, we can kind of dismantle the war on drugs. We can end mass incarceration. We can do all those things. And I really believe that we're slowly, 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 but surely moving toward that. 
But there will need to be systems that catch people because right now the only ones we have are the ones that are broken or fundamentally working exactly how they're supposed to, depending on your frame. So MAPS is the sole owner of uh, the MAPS Public Benefit Corporation, which was founded in 2014. <laughs> And that organization works for drug development. So it's essentially a small pharma company that's working toward therapy education and creating FDA-approved drugs. So right now, our flagship project, which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, is taking MDMA <laughs> through uh, the FDA approval process. And I'm happy to announce that we just we recently uh, announced, uh, we just completed our second phase three trial, which means we're now in the last leg before submitting the um, NDA to the FDA, hopefully this year. MAPS has seven principles that we operate on, and I think that they kind of help give a sense of the conceptual arc and the type of work that we're trying to bring to the world. Healing for all, prioritizing public benefit, open science, open books. I love this one because I'm all about how do we make things accessible to the public that are usually esoteric, unavailable knowledge. Set the setting. Some of you are familiar with the concept of set and setting. But we kind of believe in this idea of setting the setting. Like we're going to be create, we're actually building out the setting in which uh, political change, uh, prohibition will change, and so on as we speak. So there's this idea that we actually have some agency there. This idea of consciousness without criminalization, I'll talk a little bit about criminalization and decriminalization specifically later on. And this idea of being the bridge, we have a really kind of a wide umbrella under which we work. And you can imagine, and as you've seen more and more politically, and I think Andrew and I will talk about this a bit in the Q&A, the type of people that are attracted to psychedelics, it's not really just one type of person anymore. There was that concept for a long time, but that's really not true. Um, I think it never was, but there's this idea that there's a particular type of person who like looks a certain way and maybe smells a certain way that's into them. But that's really starting to change. And the final one is my favorite, which is seeing past the paradox, which is just a general concept when we approach these big, complex questions that relate to criminalization in our future and where we go from here. I want to talk a little bit about history because a lot of people, when they think about drug policy reform and when they're thinking about these concepts, they tend to start that clock in about 1971 when the Controlled Substances Act was passed, which is a perfectly valid spot. But I want to zoom way back and just give a few kind of milestones before we even get to 1970, uh, just to frame like my understanding and how I think about psychedelics and the current kind of current status of where we're at. I think a lot of people know this. Psychedelics have been used, psychoactive plants and fungi have been used throughout history. There's evidence going back literally thousands and thousands of years. And I put this list up, healing, cultural, communitarian, sacramental, political, and other purposes, because I think the narrative today is really dominated by this conversation about medicalization. So these are just some photos of these like super old kind of examples of psychedelics and art somewhere. So we've got Eleusius, we've got San Pedro, we've got really examples in multiple, if not every continent, over the course of a few thousand years. So there's a lot of good evidence for that. And I think that's one of the conversations that's been reemerging, which is what does it mean to be bringing these ancient practices that in many ways never disappeared into the paradigm that we live in today. So a lot of people start the history of psychedelics and drug policy, as I mentioned, or drug reform, excuse me, um, criminalization 50 years ago, but I actually bring it back to the 1500s. There's evidence that when colonizers entered what they called the new world, that they witnessed the practice of ingestion of psychoactive plants, peyote and mushrooms among others, and immediately saw that as the demonic practice. So I actually think that the groundwork for what we now know today as the war on drugs started 500 years ago. And that was like kind of the beginning of the kind of homogenization, the way that kind of culture specifically was kind of fit through a particular lens. And we see that with the cultural and literal genocide of indigenous people throughout history that in many ways is also very tied to the genocide of culture itself, of like the actual communitarian practices that were used to maintain cohesion. That you, you, know, you can bring that up back up, up to the 1800s or so. You've got a few hundred years there where practices weren't highly underground. And it was really like the mid-1800s, or yeah, mid-1800s, 1880s or so, that you see the beginning of what we kind of see of the current global drug control scheme. In the late 1800s, a lot of the world's superpowers were making a lot of money off of selling drugs. They were selling all kinds of drugs. They were selling tea and they were selling coffee, but they were also selling opium and a lot of other things over the course of many years. So when the US, yes, that's us, started pressuring some of these governments, the Dutch government, the UK government, and so on in the late 1800s to start criminalizing substances, they actually, there was actually a lot of resistance. From about 1800s to really after World War II, there was quite a bit of resistance from the globe, a lot of people don't know this, of the desire to criminalize in the first place, because they're like, why would we criminalize something if we're making bank off of it? 
And that started to change as the kind of global superpower shifted in, over the course of World War I and World War II. And suddenly the US, which had banned opium in the late 1800s because of all the Chinese immigrants that were coming into the West Coast to build the railroads, were suddenly, was suddenly not so much of an outlier, but was realizing that these mechanisms could be used for social control. And you see that repeated in the 1930s with cannabis. So you've got, like, by the time you get to, you know, the mid-1900s, you've actually got quite a few examples of that criminalization beginning to occur. And it was around that shift that you see the beginning of the current Western medical research on some of these substances, including LSD, MDMA, mescaline, peyote, et cetera. And some of it was to treat mental health conditions. You have some early uh, research on alcoholism. Stan Groff is really well known for his early research in the 50s in the Czech Republic with LSD on both survivors of the Holocaust as well as Nazis. There was some really interesting literature about research that was done in the 50s in the wake of World War II with LSD. But a lot of that kind of information started to really like bubble up in the mid-1900s. in the mid -1900s. And a lot of us know a lot of those famous names and books and so on. I'm not gonna go super into that today. So by 1951, there's over 100 articles, and a lot of people maybe aren't super aware that a lot of research was happening really fast. People were really excited about acid, you know? <laughs> they really were, they really were. It was like nothing else they had seen before, you know? Like, or, you know, people thought that at least. So there was a lot of, there was just a lot of like potential and a lot of, and there's a whole shadow history that I'm sure a lot of people know about that I'm not gonna go into today around it's using the CIA, it's using mind control. I'm not gonna talk about that today. That's really its own conversation, but it's worth getting into if you don't already know. So bringing us back up to the 1960s, so that criminalization that had started with various tax acts and various other kinds of restrictions begins to be encoded into law. And actually, I think California criminalized LSD a little bit before the Controlled Substances Act was passed. So you kind of start to see a little bit of that groundwork being set early on. And it was really 1971 that this was encoded into law. And then all this started to happen. Scientific inquiry quashed tens of millions of people. This is like funny, but it's really not. It's actually horrible, and it's what's been happening for the last 50 years. Millions of people are incarcerated. Hundreds of thousands of people are killed. And I want to just pause here, because I mentioned earlier that my mom's family is from Colombia. The reason that they left in 1986 was because the violence in Cali was so bad that people would tattoo or wear their blood type on them, because there were so many people who had to get sent to the hospital. And I, I want to say that because it's really important. It is important to talk about incarceration and so on. But I really like to remind people that the war on drugs is a global effort. And the US really led it. And there's really good literature about how the US pressured the rest of the world and the UN and so on to do that. But I just want to mention that like the cost of our cheap access to great drugs here in California like really does have a, a, a violent tail. Like a lot of these drugs that are manufactured in other parts of the world actually have an impact on people. And that has caused a lot of challenge and literal, literal violence in many places over the course of history and currently. And of course, it's really expensive. We spend a ton of money on enforcing stuff. Some people may, maybe know this already, but the Plan Colombia, you know, the uh, eradication of coca, the uh, pesticide use in Colombia, those laws, a lot of those early laws in Colombia were written in English by US lawyers when we just, when we handed them to the Colombian government, we were like, this is what you're gonna do, and we funded it. We spent billions and billions, spend, current, present tense, billions and billions of dollars on eradicating a plant that, by the way, grows a lot everywhere. It's just not working. And where are we at today? Drugs are cheaper and more potent than ever. If, if you see prohibition as uh, an attempt to actually quash and reduce the use of drugs, then it's completely failed. If you see it as a mechanism of social, social control, then it's highly effective. So it's really about the angle. And I don't like to say the war on drugs has failed, because it has, according to some metrics. But it really depends on the angle through which you're framing it. So actually, this probably should start in 1994, not 2004, because I want to appreciate Rick Strassman, who started doing DMT research in 1994 in Santa Fe or uh, University of New Mexico before. And I would say a lot of people te t tend to credit Dr. Strassman for the beginning of what we kind of see as the new wave of psychedelic research that's occurring. Starting in 2004, though, actually, MAPS was able to start a clinical trials. There's a whole story that goes into that. But we started in Spain and have kind of expanded over the course of the last bunch of years. And as I said, we just hit a really beautiful milestone of finishing the phase three trials many years later. And now we have clinical trials of LSD, psilocybin, ayahuasca, DMT, ibogaine, ketamine, and just like a bunch of substances that also have a lot of letters and numbers, that some of which are new, some of which aren't. And some of that is really focused, like I said earlier, on the treatment, treatment of mental health conditions. We, you know, we write mind-body illnesses because mental health itself is a paradigm that is useful to a certain extent. And I think that once you kind of come up to the level of, well, how much of this is inside my brain versus how much of this is a socially constructed experience, it's harder to kind of frame it as a mental health thing. It's like starting to be, maybe this is a result of our circumstances environment, who knows? Or maybe some combination of those. So that is a, a 
decent overview. And maybe one thing I'll say before I get to where we are now is this idea of uh, lineages and the way that some of this knowledge has been maintained throughout history. As I said earlier, there, you know, the beginning of the repression from the Catholic Church, the Spanish and Portuguese governments and other governments in the 1500s did not necessarily, it led to eradication and genocide and all of this oppression, but it did not fully eliminate the practice. And I think I really want to mention that there have been continued unbroken lineages that have occurred throughout history, and many of which have been interrupted and then kind of reclaimed, you could say. And I, I think of myself as someone with interrupted lineages. My lineages were interrupted by colonization, and I really work toward reclaiming those things to the extent that I can in modernity or whatever, which is a bit challenging. Let's talk a little bit about where we're at today. So a number of local policy changes have occurred in the last few years. I started working at MAPS in 20. 15, 2016, I had been working in drug policy for some time before that point. But when I started working, I really thought I was gonna be in this little niche of the drug policy world. I was like, okay, there's all this cool stuff happening with safe injection and medication assisted treatment and all these big cannabis legalization. I'm just gonna be in my little corner with psychedelics. And then two years passed and uh, Michael Paul and Rowe had to change their mind and a bunch of other things happened. And suddenly it went from being, oh, maybe we can one day imagine what a psychedelic policy reform paradigm could look like to catching up to a rapid increase of the types of changes that we were maybe hoping to see, admittedly, in kind of a world that didn't really know what to do with that speed of expansion. In 2020, a lot of you know this already, Oregon voters approved a measure, two measures actually, measures 110 and 109, to decriminalize the personal use of most drugs, this should say most, not all actually, and develop state legal access to psilocybin treatments in regulated centers. So I was uh, I, on the equity subcommittee of that program of the OPAB, Oregon Psilocybin Advisory Board up until just recently. And that program, while being passed in 2020, had a two-year incubation period, you could say, like a pre-implementation. And I imagine that people will start getting treated under that framework in about um, two months is like really where we're at. Officially started at the beginning of this year, but they have to train people. Earlier, just a few months ago, a similar bill passes in Colorado. I really love the bill in Colorado, Proposition 122, because it both decriminalized the personal use of a number of psychedelics as well as created a regulated system. And as someone who's really committed to decriminalization and moving away from the criminalization of these substances, trying to find a balance where you can have freedom to grow it yourself in your home, but also a regulated system, if that's what you want, can be really helpful and really informative in that. And of course, since 2019 especially, a number of cities have uh, consider drug policy reform. I have to put like kind of policy nerd hat on here real quick. There's a lot of uh, confusing media that talks about decriminalization. Criminal law tends to be enforced at the state level, state and federal level. Cities don't enforce them. They have law enforcement, but the actual enforcement of the law happens at the state level. The reason that's relevant is because a lot of cities that have been getting a lot of news, including Oakland, including San Francisco, have deprioritized enforcement, which basically means that the city does, isn't supposed to be spending money on enforcing laws related to that. That's not quite the same thing as decriminalization, which is what we're going for with SB 58 in California, which is reintroduced this year, as well as other bills, including the one in Colorado, that are really like taking the activity out of the criminal code at the state level, which removes that tool from the prosecutor to do so. Federal government could still get involved if they want, but, and that's a rabbit hole, maybe we can go down the Q&A if we want, but basically the federal government tends right now seems to be relatively wait and see about the things that are happening, which is very different from what it was like in ca with cannabis, you know, 20 years ago, as I'm sure a lot of you know. And this is an exciting one for those of us that are kind of in the research world. There have been, there's been a total freeze um, on federal funding for a really long time. The NIH, National Institute of Health, and other federal entities are beginning to slowly, slowly put money toward research, which is a really big deal because up until this point, most of the research has been funded by philanthropy and a little bit increasingly by other kinds of um, investment, as, although that's fairly recent. We're hoping that MDMA-assisted therapy will be considered by the FDA. That's a really big milestone that we're really excited about at MAPS. And also, it's a big deal for the field because it would kind of be the beginning of what I anticipate and what we anticipate will be a wave of many substances with multiple organizations that are all kind of looking at what, how could they be incorporated into healthcare? Is it possible, if so, how? And I do think that there will be more substances and indications that enter phase three trials, if not this year, then very soon. And then lastly, this is something I'm really, really excited about because as we move toward decriminalization, the one thing I like to remind people is that without education, harm reduction, and crisis response, we're kind of just like throwing a bunch of new ideas out there with very little support. Some of you may have noticed we have a 
rapidly deteriorating social safety net. So the, the uh, adoption of public health harm reduction uh, measures is like a major part of that. And I like to think of all of the excitement around psychedelics, of which there is a lot nowadays, as kind of a Trojan horse for other kinds of good, sensible policies, one being unarmed crisis response, for example. You have cities like Denver and Eugene, Oregon that have programs that are calling in people for mental health crises that are not armed, that are trained in de-escalation. Um, it's not perfect, but I think that if we funded de-escalation, unarmed de-escalation, I think that we would actually, like the way, especially if we did the way that we funded cops, law enforcement, I imagine that we might be able to actually like have a different type of intervention when things go wrong on the street. That's the hope. So this, this last piece is about where we go from here. First off, I'll say that I'm really excited about the possibility of uh, passing uh, SB 58 in California. We'll see, for those that you were following, SB 519 was introduced by Senator Scott Wiener in well, December, January 2021. And uh, that was, there's a whole saga on what happened with that, but it was reintroduced this year after not passing. It's a little bit, you know, a little bit simplified. There's a few things that I don't love about it, like they took ketamine out. Why wouldn't you decriminalize? No, I mean, just, just to go down a tiny rabbit hole, like if you're decriminalizing drugs for a public health reason, the mushrooms are not the things that are causing the overdoses. People see mushrooms and like, oh, this is a mushroom. It's actually imperative. It's kind of counterintuitive, but it's actually imperative to decriminalize the white powders, because that's the stuff that gets adulterated. That's the stuff that people actually have dangerous experiences of. It's kind of a sunlight effect. Suddenly, if the drug use is decriminalized, if assault happens, or if there's another crime, another thing that happens, suddenly the people who are using the drugs aren't afraid of being implicated in a crime. Suddenly they can say, oh, this thing went wrong, and I feel safe bringing that up and actually having some, some sort of response to it. Right now, reporting a lot of uh, negative impacts is disincentivized because people can't don't feel like they can safely talk about something that happened while drugs were involved. So yeah, it's like funny, but it's also very serious. It's completely serious that like the overdose crisis, that there's a very, very constant increasing in adult, increase in adulteration, the quality of drugs, cheaper and better, but also scarier in many ways. So just to close, I, I, I like to think a lot, and one of the things that inspired this conversation is this idea of like, what would a wholesome drug culture look like? As part of the articulation of this lineage, this family um, history that I have that has given me so much and allowed me to feel so clear and with like kind of this arc uh, that I feel like I'm participating along with a lot of people here, is the possibility of not having drug use and this process of healing and personal growth and expansion to be something that has to happen in the shadows. There's a lot of value in the shadow, and I encourage everybody to look closely at yours. But, <laughs> but I do think that the fact that psychedelics have been, and other drugs have been so stigmatized over such a long time means that it's really hard to have mature conversations about them. And it's very easy to like fall into the realm of tropes, and I get that all the time in my work. People are constantly like in that kind of trope stigma world. And it's actually quite radical to like demystify some of that and make room for these other ways of being that involve family related work, that involve wholesomeness and wholeness. I like to think of it as doing drugs with dignity. Can, is it possible to have a relationship with these substances that actually allows me to be a dignified person? And maybe I'll close with a, a little anecdote because I think it, it gets to what I'm, what I'm hoping to see um, in addition to custom LSD stores. My mother passed away uh, 10 years ago and she had cancer for 12 years. It was actually shortly after that that I left Fresno to come up here to the Bay Area to start law school. W one of the things that occurred in the wake of her passing was, uh, like it's happened to many families, is like this rupture. She was really like the social major center of our kind of collective social experience. We experienced a lot of grief as a result of her passing. And in 2015, partially because of these relational connections and this growth, uh, my family started drinking ayahuasca together. Uh, my grandmother, my aunts, my cousins, my brothers, uh, three generations. We've now been doing that every few years. The experience of working with my family in that context has really showed me that this idea of psychedelics as this wholesome vitamin, nutrient as part of our experience, something that's been part of our experience of consciousness and collectivism and community for so many years, is that it's actually possible to bring that back and to make it something that's not just, I was gonna say not scary. I don't think it's possible to not make psychedelics not scary. There's always going to be a little bit of that. Um, but certainly something that doesn't have to be so stigmatized, so pushed out to the margins, uh, something that's so difficult to actually have a mature conversation about. Because one of the things that I've noticed talking about psychedelics with so many people is that ultimately a lot of conversations we have about psychedelics are not about psychedelics. 
they're about grief, they're about trauma, they're about expansion, they're about community, they're about connection, they're about all the things that psychedelics might help reveal, but um, the psychedelic is really just a tool, just a catalyst. Um, and I like to remind people that this idea of this post-prohibition world that we're trying to create has a lot more of all those things, hopefully more psychedelics too, but certainly also more kind of contact with that essential aspect of ourself. So I just talked a lot, I'll pause there for now. Thank you so much for listening to me, appreciate it. So you, you've been going the medical route, but like the American medical system is sort of like notoriously flawed, like often just straight up horrifying. Um, you know, like why, why, why go the pharmaceutical route um, when there's so much like big business, big money, and sort of like scary entities that go on there? Yeah, it's a really good question. I, I'll share first a little bit of like the way that Rick Doblin, the founder of Maps, frames it, which is uh, this idea. Because keep in mind that this organization was started in uh, 01986, um, <laughs> which means that a lot of those opportunities like that we kind of see now just didn't exist at that time. And you can kind of see the arc with um, cannabis where the beginning of understanding it as a medical tool before even Prop 215 in 96 here in California. You know, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that history. But even before that, you had this idea like, oh, cannabis might be a medicine you know, for AIDS wasting syndrome or for cancer, these different indications. And now, like, even though there's a lot of flaws that I can point out with the cannabis industry, it, there is this level that, like, oh, normalizing it as a treatment maybe is a way to get into people's heads that, oh, maybe it's not as scary as a lot of other, as, as it's kind of being treated. Um, so that's the one, I would say, strategic justification. But your point is well taken, and I agree that the, and especially now, we can really feel, I'm sure, folks that are tracking, like you can really see how coming closer and closer to kind of the formal healthcare system is coming at this really scary cost because suddenly we have to deal with insurance, suddenly we have to deal with all of these kind of regulatory frameworks and all of these economic realities that kind of have created the monster that is American healthcare right now. And I try to re remember, it's sometimes easier than others, but try to rem remind people that in order to move toward really equitable access, even through a purely medical mental health frame, um, we actually like have a lot of other reform that needs to happen, whether it's with the insurance system or the other pieces. Um, and just one interesting anecdote is we're working simultaneously in the U.S. and Europe, and it's really interesting to see how in Europe, because a lot of countries uh, have their kind of internal uh, healthcare systems, uh, the kind of logic or the um, the calculus that's used to determine whether or not a drug should be approved is quite different because there's this whole aspect that's sort of taken off the table in certain places in Europe where you actually, they, are actually, they actually are thinking about affordability in a way that you don't really see American healthcare systems do it. So I, I, guess, I guess the TLDR of that whole thing is there are a lot of big costs and risks of engaging with the US healthcare system. I feel hyper aware of the way that that limits accessibility and the way that I personally balance that on like the policy advocacy side is by making sure that we have other points of access, whether it's sacramental use, decriminalized personal use and home grow, regulated adult use outside of medicine. I think that I'm a person that believes in a lot of on-ramps and a lot of off-ramps. I think healthcare is one really important place to go because a lot of people will not go to underground practitioners. They need to go to a psychiatrist. They will not. And a lot of people I know that, um, you know, don't, want to go to an underground practitioner, like really want to go to a psychiatrist or vice versa, or who people who really will never go to a psychiatrist will only go to underground practitioners. So I really see it as one element in the toolkit um, with all the big caveats and risks that you were describing. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, we've been talking about the medical route, but there is this whole religious route you mentioned. Um, so, you know, our new conservative Supreme Court has been using the religious freedom exemption to like roll back some civil liberties. Um, is there, you know, with this sort of new framing of um, religious freedom that we're probably going to see over the next few years, does that change anything in this space? This is a very interesting question um, because this is a very classic strange bedfellows kind of situation where the increased protections for religious practice in the US that have, by the Supreme Court and others, overwhelmingly been used to benefit reactionary uh, religious practice have also been the same arguments that have been used to permit sacramental use of entheogens. There's a major overlap in those two 
arguments. So what that means is that there's a, I, I don't want to I don't want to call it like a deal, deal with the devil, but there's certainly this level where <laughs> there's certainly this level where um, because of the increased permissiveness that exists under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the current kind of constitutional religious freedom protections as they exist. There's this kind of thing where it's like, oh, every time more ground is given there, there's actually potentially a stronger argument to permit sacramental use of entheogenic, or practitioners who are working with entheogens in sacramental contexts to also use those same benefits. I work very closely with, with some churches, um, some religious groups who work with entheogens, and it's Definitely an area that, um, unlike medical use, which has like a really big regulatory framework that we're already kind of plugging into, the religious freedom world is, it's a little bit harder to define. And because, it necess because the idea is like, oh, get the government out of it, it means that there's a lot more need for self-regulation, best practices, ethics within those communities, which is very different kind of from a positionality angle. Um, and... I guess just to end the answer to this, I'll say I wish that there were other mechanisms for, mechanisms for protection of these practices. But right now, because it requires making exemptions to generally applicable laws, which is what we're seeing in these other places, you get these churches, you know, the more reactionary ones are getting exemptions to like civil rights laws, like generally applicable laws. We're like, wait a minute, that's not cool. But then suddenly we want an exception from the Controlled Substances Act. So our drug use isn't considered drug use, it's considered a different thing. Um, and it's one of those places where it's a legal argument framework and we have to figure out like how, how close to the fire are we willing to get, recognizing that it's enhancing and engaging with these systems, these decisions as you described. What about the dark side of psychedelics? So, you know, there's um, historical reports of Viking berserkers eating the mushrooms before their raids and go kill a bunch of people, but um, also, in modern times, you have MK Ultra military applications, and then the most recent, you know, sort of like right-wing acid head pandemic sort of horror thing. Um, uh, you know, will psychedelics free our minds? I was at a conference in the fall, and um, I felt like such a wet blanket because one of the questions that came up was something like this. They were like. When are, the, when are the elected reps, when are these old white guys going to start doing psychedelics? Why, why, why aren't our representatives in Congress doing psychedelics? And you know, you have to like, yeah, yeah, we've got to do that. And then I had to be the person to take the mic and be like, everyone who you're scared of has been doing psychedelics for a long time. <laughs> I really, can, can they fear our minds? I certainly feel like they've done a lot for me personally, um, even though I'm really careful not to be an evangelist around that. But... Um, not necessarily. I'm a person that believes that psychedelics uh, tend to be highly attuned to their environment. Um, I'm not really sure if there's like an inherent moral value in the molecules. Um, I think that there's an argument for it depending on the context and tradition and so on. But generally speaking, I think that um, psychedelics can and are, have been throughout history, utilized in a number of different contexts, not just the fun ones that we were talking about, but also some um, more oppressive and negative ones. And I do feel like that it's context specific, and I think that that's why I feel so committed to figuring out how do we design this post-prohibition environment to make it possible for that kind of pro-social, even that has a value frame, liberatory, you could say, use to be possible. Um, and I think one of the risks of uh, kind of an unfettered, everything goes kind of framework is that you allow people to abuse and misuse that kind of the power that comes with access to psychedelics and the mind states that um, kind of are brought with them um, to use them in a way that's that's more harmful. So I do, I, I try not to have like, I try not to be too starry eyed about it because I do feel like that that context really matters. Um, and I do have concerns that without some groundwork, cultural, social, and so on, um, that they, they can and will be used to harm people um, as they currently are in some in some context. So Will they fear our mind? I hope so, but I don't think it's that simple, and I think we actually need to be quite diligent um, about yeah, what it means for them to be coming into the world stage in such a visible way. They've always been there, but in such a visible way, in a way that they're, that they're now. Cool. All right. Got a question over here. I kind of want to follow this thread. Y'all just started. Um, I'm curious how you think it'll really affect us in the American culture. I feel like we're kind of in a suicidal moment here in the United States, all kinds of ways we're killing ourselves and 
if it's a value neutral molecule and it's not the 60s and we're going for a more integrated, wholesome fruition here, how do you see that playing out? Such a good question. Um, I'm encouraged by some of the research that's been coming out around nature relatedness and openness. I do think that because the story of psychedelics in the West has to do with hippies in some ways, I think that actually kind of helps that cultural context in the way that that association means that many people who come into contact with psychedelics overwhelmingly who are not doing it in a legal context, right, are getting it with that cultural context and that cultural history. So in some ways, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling thing where the story and narrative around psychedelics as things that open your mind like tend to have the effects of opening people's minds, um, just like de facto in the wild. Um, of course, that's not always true, but so that's kind of the optimistic perspective. Um, I think to your point about like the general suicidality of American culture, like that's a deep question that I think um, to me intersects a lot with kind of the hyper individualism of how we think about mental health in the first place. And one of the concerns to kind of Andrew, your earlier point about incorporating something into healthcare without giving all the rest of the context is that we kind of treat psychedelics as the silver bullet as just another thing to consume, which you do see in some even amazing celebratory party cultures, you still see that. And um, I do worry that uh, psychedelics are uh, not as strong as, in that sense, in the culture, in, 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 uh, are not, as, not strong enough to really break out of that. And I don't know, um, I was at a conference some years ago and um, someone asked a question about psychedelics and capitalism, what happens when they intersect? And um, someone brought up the anecdote that uh, in the 80s, as you had the rise of televangelism, a lot of people thought that Christianity was stronger than capitalism, and they were like, it'll never get subsumed into that. So I don't, I try not to be like too uh, hyper optimistic about the fact that psychedelics, whether or not they're neutral or however they fit, like can and will be incorporated into the monster of consumption that defines so many of our lives, and that is a concern that I have, which is also why I fight for home grow, because if you can't, if you can home grow, then a lot of that changes. But again, it's a longer conversation, but that shadow is very real. One over there. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the state law, the California state law, and particularly why ketamine got taken out of it. I find that interesting because Kaiser will give it to me, um, and I get ads for it on Facebook all the time. <laughs> um, let's talk about ketamine. Um, so we were talking about this before because people are like, wait a minute, why, how am I getting Facebook ads? Like, how, what, in what paradigm? Um, I'll talk about the bill first to answer your question, then maybe I'll get on soapbox after that. Um, so uh, shortly after Oregon voters passed uh, measures 109 and 110 in November 2020, um, Senator Scott Weiner tweeted actually, uh, I wanna pass a bill about psychedelics. And it was funny because no one, it was kind of, you know, we're all like, oh my God, like, there's gonna be a bill in California about psychedelics, let's do this. And there was a coalition that was brought together in early 2021. The original language of the bill uh, decriminalized the personal use of six substances psilocybin, DMT, ibogaine, mescaline, excluding mescaline from peyote, uh, ketamine, MDMA, and LSD, so seven. Um, and there are a number of changes that are made over the course of its kind of traversing through the various committees within the legislature and the um, assembly. Uh, and one of those changes was eventually all of the synthetics were taken out. So the version that was reintroduced this year just has DMT, psilocybin, mescaline, not from peyote, and ibogaine. So over the course of a couple of years, all of the synthetics were eventually taken out. But ketamine was the first. So ketamine has a reputation, um, although I think that it's over-indexed in law enforcement world as a date rape drug, and uh, along with GHB and rufinol. And that's based on DEA data that I did a lot of digging on and couldn't find the source for. But <laughs> not to say it doesn't happen. I'm not trying to diminish that. I'm just like, there were a lot of claims that were being made early on about ketamine specifically. Um, and the argument, and an argument was made that, whoa, it's available legally, so why can't we just decriminalize it? Um, and the reasoning ultimately, I think, boiled down to this idea that like white powders are really scary and synthetics are not something we can just create. Um, we can just allow it to be out there. And even with my like super anti-prohibitionist frame, there's some logic to that in the sense that people are not that afraid of growing cacti or mushrooms in their backyard or in their closet. But like once you start to talk about synthetics, if you don't have like a safe supply, like an actual supply mechanism, then suddenly you have labs in residential areas. 
some of you may have seen there was an explosion in San Francisco last week. That was a BHO lab, um, an underground um, uh, cannabis extraction lab that was in that home. So people are really afraid of that. And it was interesting because one of the issues that came up when I testified in the California State Legislature around this bill was the question came up, like, where did the drugs come from? And we're arguing the whole time. We're like, let us pass safe supply. Let us have a regulated like supply mechanism. But that was past the line that what people were willing to do so we could only decriminalize personal use. Um, but that is the paradox, which is like, why can't we get access to these things? It's because of this kind of supply and manufacture question. So that's the reasoning it was taken out. But just to say a little bit more about why I think it's a big problem that it was taken out is that, first off, one thing that I think a lot of legislators and maybe law enforcement aren't thinking of that's so intuitive is that when you, I believe that when we, if we were to decriminalize certain substances, you would actually reduce the adulteration of those substances because you would disincentivize cutting those substances with a drug, especially if the other drug is still illegal. So if you decriminalize MDMA, suddenly it's really unlikely that you'd get MDMA analogs on the street because why would you sell a drug that's still sort of illegal if you could just sell the real thing? Um, of course, that's like kind of basic logic. It doesn't always work that way in the underground. It's not quite so simple. But that was kind of like the, the reasoning and the direction. And ultimately, uh, the move toward keeping it to just plant-based substances uh, was seen as being kind of more viable, as we see out, saw in Colorado. So I think that will continue to be the first wave is like where it's like purely plant-oriented. Um, but I would like to see from a pure public health perspective, white powders also get decriminalized because those are the ones that are the most dangerous. How can this policy go forward when public opinion is that drug use is a moral failing? How is that going to be fixed? A lot of polling is happening. <laughs> To start, a lot of polling is happening, especially in the states where you're seeing legislation move forward. And this year, I think that there will be a dozen bills introduced. There may already be a dozen bills introduced across the country. Um, so what's happening is you have, there's like the true believers that have been in it for a long time. And the now, literally in the last two years, it went from being like, am I going to be a legislator that sticks my neck out for this issue? To being like, oh, I can't be the last one on this issue. That happened really fast. So I would slightly push back. That is the public opinion of public opinion, <laughs> but it's not actually so true anymore. Um, partially because of the kind of the again the desperation, the need, and of course the narrative that I didn't even go into it. I won't too much today around like veterans and PTSD and survivors of sexual assault and like we need to help people. How do we help people? So there is actually this kind of which to me is a little bit scary. There's kind of a pendulum swinging to like too much hype. Um, but you'd be surprised at how open people are now because they're getting so much, they're hearing so much about all of this hype. And I feel like part of our job at MAPS is to like keep it like, yeah, we're really excited too, but actually there's risks and we should talk about those risks and we should mitigate them by having crisis response and education, da, 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 da. Um, so yeah, that's changed fast. I'm not saying that, it's, that there's a lot of people who still feel that way, um, but I would say rapidly decreasing. Now people are getting way too excited. Do drugs come off schedule one historically? Um, I love this question. Um, so, little drug policy nerd moment. Um, there's this concept called bifurcated scheduling. It's one of those legal fictions. So right now, um, drugs are on these different schedules, right? Control substance stack, schedule one through five, one being the most restrictive, five being the least. Um, do drugs come off of the schedule? <sighs> So cannabis currently has three derivative drugs that are, all of, that are legally available, dronabinol, marinol, and epidiolex. All of those are cannabis derived. Um, cannabis, good old weed, is still schedule one. But you're like, wait a minute, schedule one requires that there's no medical use. If you have proven medical use, how can it stay in schedule one? The government has invented this concept called bifurcated scheduling, where the drug product, which is a term of art, which refers to the drug that's approved by the FDA, which includes the manufacturing framework, the REMS, the risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, all the things that come with the thing. It goes down, I mean, it's as detailed as like the color of the pills, what's on the package. That is a drug product. The drug product, even if the molecule is identical, is scheduled separately. So you've got three drugs that are cannabis derived that are not on schedule one while cannabis is still in schedule one. And our current theory is that with, with MDMA and with psilocybin, that really working against this, don't, I'm not endorsing this, but it's very possible that the uncontrolled version of those drugs remains in schedule one while the drug product gets placed in a schedule other than schedule one. And the, important re the, the thing that's important that, about that that's also relevant is that scheduling and criminalization are not always linked. 
criminalization is a multi-tiered thing that's also highly influenced by the U.S. Sentencing Commission, which is the judicial, federal judicial body that basically sets norms for um, sentencing in the United States, um, trickles down to the state level. So I like to remind people, I appreciate that kind of question, like I like to remind people that moving away from, even if we were to fully deschedule or reschedule, that alone would not necessarily eliminate criminalization. That may take more advocacy at the sentencing level, um, at the state level, and, and so on. That, so I, it'd be nice, that would make sense. It's like, oh, it's like the higher up than the worse or whatever, but it's not quite so simple. But we are working toward that, and there is a big push to actually fully de or reschedule. It's, I think it's possible, for example, that cannabis gets fully descheduled to take an out of the control substance act. That's pretty optimistic, but it's not, it's not crazy. Whereas I think the other drugs, it'll be harder to take them off, but it may be possible if we have a more sane policy to actually just kick them out of schedule one at least. Okay. I think that sort of leads well into the last question. How do we, you know, how do we make sure this legalization and decriminalization process is um, accessible? You know, it doesn't just benefit um, people who have access to resources or who can navigate the insurance system in the right way, um, but actually has effects on the prison system and, you know, doesn't end up, you know, ends up being sort of a fair distribution. So unlike the prohibition of heroin or cocaine or methamphetamine or even cannabis, where you have a large identifiable population that's been impacted by those criminalizations, but a lot of people in prison because of those drugs, basically. Um, so you can really see the impact of the current drug control scheme with respect to people who use those drugs. Psychedelics, it's a little bit harder because as I mentioned, a lot of the criminalization and the kind of cultural context that um, allowed psychedelics to be criminalized and repressed so early meant that a lot of the, the work that had to get done by prohibition, you could say, it was already, it was already happened. My ancestors, a lot of our, you know, the, my cultural history, like the use of psychedelics had been already rep had been repressed for 400 years by the time Nixon came along, you know? So I say that to say that um, one thing that we can do that we have been pushing at the state level is pairing any decriminalization with expungement and with kind of the elimination of records but even if we were to do that, just looking at this soberly, the number of people who would be benefited by wiping records related to psychedelics is still quite small. Not to say that it's not important. MDMA right now is the, of, of the psychedelics. We can argue if, whether or not MDMA is a psychedelic. But um, of, of the kind of classic psychedelics, MDMA is the one that's been the most heavily enforced. And those numbers are in like the single digits or lower. Most of the, in the and they may be over. You know, we may have may know more people who've been impacted by that um, because of the worlds that we may or may not be in. But Overall, the number is fairly small. So what I like to say is, I think that in addition to decriminalization, like real decrim, where you can have home grow, where there's actually no mitigator between you and the substance, where you can just grow it yourself. I think that the other thing that I like to do in my call, call to action sometimes in conversations like this is that for people that are interested in psychedelic decriminalization or psychedelic policy, to actually bring that energy to these other um, these other drugs and these issues related to other drugs, supervised consumption sites, medication assisted treatment, um, actual housing and care for people who are addicted or are dependent on other drugs, like that type of thing, people can say forever, like once a drug user, always a drug user, it's always the same. It's kind of like the point that was being made earlier, like, well, isn't it just morally bad? I think that until all people who choose to use drugs are able to be treated with dignity, we're just making gains on something that could always be pulled out from under our feet. So I do think that moving toward that really broad vision for a post-prohibition world um, that actually has access to healthcare and support and housing and environmental justice and all the other things that we really want to see, I think that like I, I like to say like pivot that energy that's about that's focused on psychedelics and that comes out of that personal growth into these other places where we can bring justice because to me. If we don't, you know, if we're not all free and working together to eradicate the stigma, then like it can always be turned against us in the long run. So I see that as like we're all part of this together. Like you can think of yourself as different from someone who's using fentanyl on the street, but the government doesn't. So we got to work for all of us if we're trying to do anything at all. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs>